<clears throat> the time had arrived. Matthew began. You recall our um, visit to the chapel estate. Lest I try to forget, she said with a twist of the mouth. Yes, certainly. Well, he didn't wish to dwell on the fact that a mound of horse manure had saved them both from having their eyes plucked out by Simon Chapel's trained hawks. When I went back to the estate, after all that was over, I found a book, he hesitated. In for a penny, in for a hundred pounds. A book, she repeated. Now, please bear with me. The book I found is a volume titled The Lesser Key of Solomon, a very interesting publication, and as I later discovered, a rare distribution. All right, so you found a religious tome. What is it? A religious tone, not exactly, except perhaps to some. The volume in Chapel's library was hollowed out as a hiding place for a key to another book holding a bag of money. Only it wasn't a book, it was a box made to look like a, well anyway. The curious thing is that I discovered a second copy of the Lesser Key of Solomon in Fells Library on Pendulum Island and a third copy in his house at the village. I wouldn't have thought of that man as being religious Ah, said Matthew, and now came the blast of the cannon, though delivered as meekly as a mouse's mew. Uh, the tome is a catalog of the demons of hell, where their descriptions and purposes, also instructions on how to summon them for particular needs. He kept his eyes on his wine glass, but even so he saw her give a start. It was so severe, the breeze from it almost killed a candle. What? He fortified himself with a drink of claret. To go on, he must. It is Professor Fell's intent to use that book in determining which demon to call up from a mirror created by a sorcerer in Italy just for that purpose. And now he did raise sickly eyes upon a face which a moment before had been glowing, but now appeared as gray as a scribbed out wash rag. You see, he said, with perhaps the most absurd half hanging grin he'd ever managed to impose upon his mouth. Oh, my Lord, Barry breathed, when she could find the air. Have you come all this way to lose your senses? Furthermore, Matthew trudged on upon this sulfurous surface, I have bargained with the professor to help him in his efforts to find the mirror. Again, the weight of his dumb grin shamed his face. Now really, don't, don't look like that. Such a thing can't be true. My ears, she said, her eyes wide, I can't be hearing this. Am I still drugged? I bargained with Fell, Matthew said to let me leave the village and find the stolen book of potions that would return you to reality. Also, that he would put both you and Hudson on a ship back to New York and be done with any idea of revenge he might have in mind from my uh, past transgressions against him on behalf of the Herald. Madness, she interrupted. He's mad, and he has infected you with it. Matthew, are you even hearing yourself? <laughs> Believe me, I wish I wasn't. I think, she said, I need something stronger than this wine. Matthew, are you telling me you intend to help Professor Felt call <coughs> up a demon from hell itself? Did his face want to slide down off his skull? He gave a nervous little laugh. <laughs> you, you make it sound a bit ridiculous. <laughs> it is insane. And you a man of such intelligence, or at least I presume so, not only to speak of the insanity of it, but the, the she struggled for a further description, evil of it, he supplied, evil of it. Yes, thank you very much, Barry said. Her, her voice had gotten away from her and was reaching other tables. She spent a moment composing herself while Matthew had another drink to finish off the glass. No, she said at last more quietly, but no less fervently. I would never put myself in the position of having, of barring your way to any advancement, but I'll put myself in the path of your eternal damnation at the hands of that, that maniac. You can't do it, Matthew. No, tell me you won't do it. Hear me out, he said, and the tone of his voice might have 
uh, have had in it some of Julian Devane's matter-of-fact gravity because it froze from escape the next words intended from Barry's lips. Let me explain about why Fell kidnapped the opera star, Madame Candelari. It wasn't to secure her, but to get her makeup girl, Rosabella. It seems Fell discovered that Rosabella is a cousin to the man named Brazio Valeriani and saw him three years ago at the funeral of Lorraine's father in Salerno, uh, that's in Italy. <coughs> I am a teacher and I know my geography, she replied with a suitable mixture of fire and ice. Yes, of course, pardon, anyway. I found out from Rosabella that Valeriani's father, Ciro, had an interest in science and had created something that he tried to destroy, but was unable to. His death was suicide by hanging. But every year on her birthday, Rosabella received the gift of a hand mirror Ciro had fashioned in his workshop. So obviously he had an interest not only in science, but also the art of mirror making. Matthew paused to take a breath. He thought Barry might interject, but she remained silent. He went on. When Julian and I went, were on our mission, I found out from somewhere, someone else the whole story of this supposedly enchanted mirror, if such is to be believed. He decided there was no need to bring the name of Cardinal Black into this. Best hope that that thing had either frozen to death or crawled back to his hole after their escape from Samson Lash. The tale, and I shall take this with a handful of salt as you should, is that the death of Ciro's wife threw his mind off balance and began to be intrigued by the darker arts. He, in time, paid to be introduced to an aged man who I suppose one would call a wizard, a sorcerer, a warlock, whatever the proper term might be, by name Senna Celestre, who, according to my informant, was well known to the sort of individuals who follow such things and who passed away last August at the age of 94. But Celestre helped Ciro with the construction of a freestanding, full-length mirror and, as I understand, added the reflective element from his own workshop. The purpose for the thing was to summon a demon from hell. Then the mirror would serve as a passageway. Insane, said Barry, but then returned to silence. Yes, possibly so, <laughs> probably so. It bursting at the gate of his mind was an episode he had so far been successful at forgetting or even pretending it never happened a night ride in service to a strange client named Carlos von Essen on behalf of an even weirder individual named Wallach Bardenkier, bringing Matthew into the middle of a war between, and that's one of the stories in the short story book. <laughs> well, they were made of nightmares, whatever they'd been, and in speaking of the mirror with Hudson, the great one himself had said, think on it. What if it's real? Now, now don't speak and don't roll your eyes. You and I both know there's plenty out there that can't be put into little boxes or tied up with neat little bows. And some, for sure, Hudson was correct. Of course, insane, Matthew amended to Barry, but according to what I was told, and keep the salt at hand, as I've said, Cyril may have tried to call a demon through the mirror, lost his nerve, or came to his senses, and damaged it enough to close the passageway in time. Later, he may or may not have repaired it and then hanged himself but where it is now is the problem. What you wish to solve for the professor, Barry said, is he paying a fee to the Herald Agency? Yes, he is. The clothes you and I are wearing, the food and wine we're enjoying, the hotel, the nights we spent together, your life and your freedom. Most certainly the best value for service this agency's ever received. I think the worst, if a man of his ilk could get hold of such a thing and it's actually true, oh my Lord, Matthew, what might become of the entire world? It's not true, it can't be. God himself wouldn't let such a thing exist. Maybe God himself damaged it through Ciro enough to stop the demons from coming out. Maybe then Satan himself went to work entrancing Ciro to fix it and after that was done, the man realized he couldn't destroy it and now he's talking insanities, Matthew said quietly, though the idea of a man being caught between two powers in eternal war made sense to him due to his own experience. This is my belief if indeed the mirror still exists and it can be found, it's going to be simply an object of furniture. Yes, it may have been aided in its manufacture by a man who believed himself and who others may have believed to have been a sorcerer of some kind, but in the end, only a mirror. No more than that. As I say, if any part of it still exists. Somewhere in Italy? How do you know it's not elsewhere? How can you know? Not for any surety, but I know something that the professor 
has not known where to begin. I've told him we are sailing for Venice, but nothing else. And why Venice in particular? Because, Matthew said, in speaking of Rosabella, she told me that at Ciro's funeral, Brosnan inquired of her age. When she told him she was 13, he made the comment that 13 years was a good age for wine, and especially for Amarone. It started me thinking that Brasio might be involved in the wine business there, possibly himself the owner of a vineyard. Later, I learned that Amarone comes from the province of Verona, Benito region near Venice, therefore a starting point. So first, you're searching for Ciro's son, and that's why the professor wanted information from Rosabella. Exactly. Matthew leaned back in his chair and took a deep breath. The brunt of it was done. To be perfectly exact, I told the professor I would find Brasiano for him. The rest about the mirror is not my responsibility. <coughs> I would think hard about that last statement, she countered. If you believe he's going to release you after you find the sun and before the mirror can be found, I suspect I may know him better than you do. After all, you will have proven yourself a success in the worst possible way. True, Matthew thought, but he didn't speak it. He sat silently for a moment, listening to the to the strolling girl with a guitar sing the lamentation of Chloris, which seemed fitting at the moment due to the amount of time he and Barry were to be absent from each other. If Barry followed the path of Chloria out of despair at their parting, she would be opening her heart and bed to Ashton McCaggers, which was the most agreeable, disagreeable image to have in mind. And as if reading that mind, or perhaps seeing the dour expression on Matthew's face, Barry asked, how long must he search for this man? A year, two, five? And also he may not have any knowledge at all of the mirror. Likely he sold to a junk dealer after his father's funeral. A possibility. As for the time frame, I believe a trip to the Amarone vineyards of the Benito region may show quick results one way or the other. May, she repeated, shook her head. You should have had a lawyer draw you up a contract. The only lawyer in that bunch, said Matthew, is probably so addled by Fell's drugs that he thinks he's living in Sherwood Forest with a merry men. No, I have your life as a contract, and that's good enough for me. But why isn't Hudson going back to New York as well? I tried, he resisted, and that was all Matthew needed to say. She reached for his hand, grasped it, and then squeezed. Her eyes were brimming, but the tears were yet to fall. I am on the razor, she said, keeping her voice composed with a mighty effort. I dread like like hell for you to do this. But I know you. I know that when you make a promise, you feel it's your duty to keep it, even in a situation as despicable as this. If you were to join me on board the ship home, I would rejoice to the angels, but instead I have to give you over to the devils because that's your promise. And now the tears did drop and getting a glimpse of their glimmer, the guitar girl turned away to to air her limitations in a less emotional area. <clears throat> I love you, Matthew, and I love your sense of duty, but I must tell you, <clears throat> I hate this moment like the blackest sin. I'm not too fond of it either, he said, with the most gentle smile he could muster. He leaned forward to give her a kiss, more intimate kisses would come later, minus an audience. <clears throat> Let's order another bottle, shall we, he asked, and I have an idea. He got up, went to the guitar girl, and at her pause, asked her to come to the table and sing the first verse of Lavender's Blue. <coughs> she came along when Matthew had seated himself, and after strumming the first few chords, she began singing in her high, soft voice. Lavender's blue, dilly dilly, lavender's green. When I am king, dilly dilly, you should be queen. Who told you so, dilly dilly? Who told you so? It was mine own heart, dilly dilly, that told me so. Perfect, said Matthew with his arm around Barry, who seemingly had melted into him. Thank you very much. And he sweetened his thanks with a large tip of Professor Fell's money that likely had been secured by cutting someone's head off. <laughs> Thank you.